Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session today. Can your business afford a cyber attack and data breach webinar? I'm your host, Zaxon. So today's webinar is organized by SCI and presented by MBA at NetPlus. In the current climate and with the disruption brought by COVID-19, business is relying on technology more than ever before. So which means that chances of data breach and cyber attack is higher than ever. So and with the recent amendment bill of their personal data protection, it is very important for business to really, really embark on a good and effective data protection and cyber attack prevention plan. So uh, before we start our session, let us invite our speakers today who will be sharing the insight of data protection and cyber attack prevention topics to you guys. So to say hi to all of you. So first, we have Kenneth from NetPlus. Afternoon, Kenneth. Hi, hey. afternoon, Jackson. Hello. Afternoon. Hi. Today also joining us is Kalin. Sorry for the name. Kalin from IMDA. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Afternoon. Hi, afternoon, Kalin. So also from IMDA is Dominic. Dominic, afternoon. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. So last but not least, Elsa from Chubb Insurance. Hi, Elsa. Hello, everyone. So without further ado, uh, let's start our session of Can You Business Afford a Cyber Attack and Data Breach webinar now. So I'll now hand over the time to our first speaker today, Kenneth, to start the sharing. Kenneth, please. Thank you, Zaxon. Let me just share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> so good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you're all coping well. Definitely been a tough year today. So let us stay positive and uh, let's get through this year as high as we can. Set the stage to Chong next year in 2021. My name is Kenneth, Commercial Director at NetPlus. Today, I'll be sharing insights on the cyber landscape. What are some of the business implications when a company faces a cyber attack and data breach? Identifying your weakest link. And most importantly, what are some of the mitigation measures you can consider to adopt for your business today? I hope by the end of my sharing, uh, companies can understand the need to strengthen data and cybersecurity resilience, to build customers' trust and emerge stronger as your business evolves with the digital age. Due to the nature of my role, I speak to businesses all the time, and sadly, there are still many maintaining the thought, cyber attack, data breach, ransomware, it won't happen to them. I'm curious where they get that confidence from. It's like saying, I won't get COVID virus. So when someone says that they won't get COVID, you start to wonder, is it ignorance? Don't know enough the seriousness of the virus? Or is it arrogance, thinking you're immune to COVID virus, right? So while the internet forms a critical part of your business, it is also a platform that opens you to cyber attacks. Without knowing, your business may have already been compromised. Your business holds critical and sensitive data such as contracts, financial records, employee data, consumer data. The question is, are you doing enough to keep them safe? So let me use an analogy. If you have a lot of cash in your office room, you will take precaution to keep the cash safe. Whether you lock them in office safe or you hide it somewhere that you feel is safe and secure. So with a huge cash kept in the office, should it be only finance concern? Is it a matter handled by the finance? Or considered as a business risk because there's a possibility of theft, there's a possibility of fire. So for Tao case, I like to think that you will take this as a business risk because it involves money. Likewise for cybersecurity, question companies need to ask themselves, is cybersecurity an IT issue or a business risk? Protecting your data assets is of huge importance today as we evolve. We need to shift our mindset in the way we view data. First, we need to recognize that your data is an asset. Your data is valuable and data is the new king today. So the more data you have, the more valuable you are and the more you have to lose. So with pandemic, offices are either empty or half empty today. Many companies face abrupt changes and adopted quick fixes to cope with work from home arrangements and they had to change the way they traditionally operate. I'm sure you have changed as well. And likewise, your employees will have adopted new solutions to cater to the new way of working by now. So various cybersecurity reports during the same period have reported that cyber attacks have soared since the COVID virus swept in. A rise in phishing email, a rise in ransomware, and so on and so forth. So employees working remotely using home computers 
personal laptops, which employers may not have full control. Employees using unsecured Wi-Fi networks, accessing email via the web portals, or they're downloading free applications to help them in their work. Now, these expose your company to cyber threats, leaving you vulnerable to cyber attacks and data breaches. So many companies do not see the relevance in having cyber protection. So for example, I am a restaurant, I'm an f and I'm a retailer. They may not see why anyone would want to attack them. Enterprises, government, yes, they are always being targeted. Enterprises like LinkedIn, Adobe, Yahoo, you know, Google it and the news are all there. These are big enterprises. So are SMEs and local businesses exposed to cyber risks? The large enterprises have significantly strengthened their cybersecurity over the years, making it harder for hackers to attack. Hence, the net is cast wider with hackers moving down the value chain, turning their attention towards SMEs and basically any company, which is why you hear of news that even a small local retail florist shop can get hacked. With the increase in cyber attacks, cybersecurity is no longer an IT issue and must be viewed as a business risk. And the stats have supported that SMEs are not, support, are not spared either. It was mentioned in Singapore's cyber, Safer Cyberspace Master Plan 2020 that almost 40% of attacks in Singapore are targeting SMEs. In another report, Singapore SME Cyber Preparedness Report by CHARP, 65% of SMEs were victims of a cyber attack. 40% of all breaches involve customer records. 53% of cyber incidents in the past one year were caused by employees. Now, personally, I find this particular stat alarming. Almost one in two employees is directly or indirectly the cause of a breach. And this could possibly be due to a lack of cyber risk awareness. If 50% of your employees are not aware, it would also mean 50% are not taking the rightful measures to protect and secure, which leads to a risk of data breach, ransomware, and it's like a landmine, you know, waiting to be stepped on. As the headline goes, it seems that Singapore is a hotspot for cyber attacks, and news reported that Singapore SMEs are taking cyber attacks too lightly, and there is a lack of cyber preparedness among SMEs. So let us zoom into the cyber threats. Website defacement, phishing, ransomware is increasingly rampant today and the business implications it can potentially cause. The latest report, Singapore Cyber Landscape by Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, CSA, reported that 873 websites in Singapore were defaced in 2019, a 44% increase as compared to 2018. The majority affected were SMEs from various sectors including education, finance, manufacturing, and retail. Phishing remained a popular tactic, with the number of phishing URLs detected by CSA jumping about 200% in, in 2019. And during the COVID, between March to May, Channel News Asia reported that more than 1,500 malicious phishing URLs targeted Singapore, more than double from the previous three months before March. So many of these URLs, I'm sure you have also received some, that were disguised as governments hoping that you will click on them, thinking that they are legit when you're applying for the COVID grants. And also 35 reports of ransomware cases in 2019. And this affected various industries, including gaming, travel and tourism, manufacturing and logistics. So let us understand how these attacks can actually affect your business. Starting with web defacement, how does it impact your business? How does it apply to you? Is it really a case of mischief when you know, someone bored and decided to deface your website? Now, there are different types of defacement. There's visual and there's non-visual. So some examples of web, visual web defacement and pretty high profile cases and as recent as the Trump presidential campaign, the campaign website was defaced and then our neighbors, Google Malaysia, there's Thai Airways. What about Singapore, you may ask? Locally, we have SMRT, 13 schools in Singapore, Credit Bureau Singapore had their website defaced. Political motivation where attackers choose to deface related websites to air their views. It can also be using such a platform to showcase their skill sets or simply 
mischief. So what about non-visual defacement? Unlike political motivation or mischief, stealing data, stealing sensitive data is another key motivation because data can be sold on the dark web. So first example, and with just 22 lines of code, it has affected more than 400,000 victims in the UK. For example, British Airways had their website breached and it went undetected for more than two months. And this happened in 2018. Personal and payment information were compromised. And I think they were fined for 20 million pounds in UK. So with just 22 lines of code, the new script was made, able to capture the names, the addresses, the credit card numbers, and imagine this, your CVV credit card codes. And they did this without disturbing the flow of commerce or, or raising any suspicion. It was basically business as usual for the website, except that the information was sent to a database under the hacker's control. Another example, local fashion retailer, Love Bonito. Customers' personal information were exposed, including the credit card, the orders, the shipping details, the CVV numbers as well, and the phone numbers. So Love Bonito found the malicious code had been added to his website, his e-commerce website. And they actually had to conduct a higher forensics to conduct the investigation. So for website defacement, it is not just, oh, my website is defaced and you know quickly restore your website and it's BAU. The business implication is much more than that. Users may be redirected to another website. You are losing sales, losing opportunity because the payment and information is provided somewhere else. So besides opportunity and revenue loss, you actually incur more costs, tangible and intangible, from reimbursement costs, PR marketing, notification costs. I like to say that our website, you no know, corporate websites, is your battle flag. So imagine the battle flag is down. What is the impact in terms of reputational loss? Data leak is a data breach. Sensitive data visible to public, even if it's unintentional, it is still a data breach. And this is going to be costly with legal suits from third party, regulatory fines, penalties, etc. So just on the web defacement alone, and we're already talking about tens of thousands of dollars and possibly much more. Moving on to email phishing. Today, phishing has evolved, taking on a number of variations. You will hear things like spear phishing, whaling, social engineering, etc., etc. No, they are termed differently, but all for the same purpose. Attempting you to bait, you know, bait try to bait the user to click on the link, the attachment, or download so that they can get the sensitive information or to receive the funds or get you to transfer the funds. And by the way, do you know that there is a fishing kit for sale? It costs you $20 per fish kit and it's found on the dark web. So imagine this. There are so many of such services and the ease to such services available. It is not surprising that we see phishing emails increasing, especially during the pandemic. An example of phishing. Many phishing emails are designed to be perceived by the receiver as being sent internally and the actual sender's email address is actually hiding behind a mask. You may ask, how come you can still receive so, such emails when you have in place antivirus software? In many phishing emails today, it does not contain virus. What it contains is a redirection, a link to redirect you elsewhere where you are usually required to enter details. It is basically phishing for your information. So when you click on the attachment or the link in the email, it redirects you and you provide your sensitive information or data like your ID, your password, which will then allow the hackers, the threat actors to initiate their malicious intent. So besides the cyber attack where it disrupts your business, sensitive information when fallen into the hands of a wrong party could possibly lead to payment transferring of funds to the hacker. Hackers may also be using a real email account impersonating the real owner of the account to defraud the company, your customers, your partners, employees into sending money to the hacker's account. I've heard stories like this on so many occasions, and these are usually not reported in the news, but doesn't mean it's not there. And I can tell you, it is increasingly common today. 
Besides monetary loss, ransomware is another concern. Threat actors today use multiple ways to attack you. And you are denied access until you pay the ransom, and usually in cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin. And one Bitcoin is trading around 24,000 Singapore dollars today. So now, even if you do regular backups of your file servers, sophisticated hackers still can find a way to your backup, delete your backup first, and then deny you access to your server. So phishing email can actually play out multiple types of scenarios, from getting infected with malware, to losing data, to getting ransomware. These do not only disrupt your business operations, but also implicate your business with regulatory, legal, and reputational loss. So what happens when there is a data breach? You hire forensics to investigate how it happened, legal review on implications of the data breach. You will also need to notify the affected parties, set up hotline, credit monitoring for the affected users, basically also spending more marketing dollar to manage the negative image. There's also legal fees to think about. There's third party settlements, reputational loss and business income loss. So all in all, it's pretty hefty. Can your business afford a data breach or a cyber attack today? So it is important that companies recognize where is their weakest link and people are the weakest link in every organization. You can have the best cybersecurity, protecting your servers, the network, your desktop, laptop devices. One wrong click by an employee today can simply cause serious damage to your organization. Having shared the cyber threats, the next question is, what can businesses do to mitigate the cyber risk that was just discussed? What can you do? Today, you may have installed you know, antivirus into your laptops or your PCs, but you did not install a firewall to protect your network. So while your laptop is safe, your server is not, it is vulnerable to a cyber attack. Companies need to view cybersecurity holistically from various angles because cyber attacks is not from one angle, it is multi-angles. So there are many cybersecurity solutions available for different purposes. And you can consider to shift up your defense parameters, redefine your first layer of defense at the internet level to protect your network. You also want website monitoring solutions that can detect and notify you, as well as having the ability to do a quick website restore. All the more so if your website has sizable traffic or you are collecting sensitive data, you should have this. You will also need email protection today with the amount of email phishing, the viruses, the empty spam. So with antivirus, anti-spam, anti-phishing, it scans the email content for malware, for malicious things. And importantly, sometimes you know we are unsure if this is real or not, is this genuine? We have the solution that allow you to open in a, the link in a safe portal. And as shared earlier, employees are the weakest link. You need to ensure that they're always on guard, right? always on the alert. Conduct phishing simulation exercises, for example, every month, every quarter, or half yearly. You know? When employees click on phishing links, ah, you click, you go for e-training. Training is important because if you don't take action, the very same people is just one click away from causing the company to have a data breach and ransomware. So if your company face challenges in adopting or managing any IT solutions, consider IT managed services as another feasible option. So what is IT managed service, you may ask? It is very common today where companies big and small has only one IT personnel or a lean IT team responsible for all the technical duties from troubleshooting, dealing with connectivity issues, and hardware, software, the list goes on, right? So while budget is every company's concern, I'm sure it is your concern as well, hiring skilled professional is just as challenging. The task is even harder when trying to find one person that can handle everything from network to system infrastructure to cybersecurity. And many times in SME environment, the decision makers are not technically savvy. Generally, they don't have a big IT team today, so the news reported that while businesses would like a bigger teams to combat cyber attacks, 67% of them said that recruiting and training cybersecurity personnel has become more difficult in the last 12 months. 
So with staffing and budget, these are two key deterring factors why companies tend to hold back in implementing or enhancing their cybersecurity. So with NetPlus as a managed service provider, from cybersecurity network to system infrastructure, businesses can view NetPlus as, ex as an extension to the IT department, where we support your IT managers to manage the network, system infrastructure, and cybersecurity. NetPlus personnel are also trained and industry certified and working with your IT team to provide the highest value to you. The trend today with software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service becoming the new normal, businesses are also turning towards an OPEX model. So NetPlus as a managed service provider, besides the usual CAPEX, we also offer business an OPEX model option. And importantly, we offer 24 by seven support, monitoring, and also reporting. So having managed services allow you to focus on your business and not on the technology itself. I will now share a short video providing an overview of NetPlus suite of services. Uh, instead of continuing hearing my voice, yes, please enjoy the short video. It's about two minutes. So you're an organization and you use multiple vendors for internet, cybersecurity, phone systems, and cloud computing services, all of which ends up costing you thousands of dollars and tens of hours spent on juggling between service providers. That's where NetPlus comes in, a managed communication service provider on a mission to simplify and satisfy your communication needs. We have evolved from providing carrier agnostic business internet connectivity to other managed services, such as data, voice, video, cloud services, cybersecurity, mobility, and data analytics over a single converged network. Our managed data services include internet, WLAN, SD-WAN, cloud, IT monitoring, link balancer, endpoint backup, server co-location, and true diverse connectivity. Need help with your voice services? We can help you out with IP PBX in the cloud or on-premise, SIP trunking, IDD, cloud audio conferencing, and global virtual numbers. Need to manage your video calls, recordings of conferences, and CCTV surveillance with analytics? We've got you covered. NetPlus can also secure your network availability with state-of-the-art DDoS mitigation facilities, firewalls, 24-7 SNOC, and assessing your vulnerabilities with vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. APT. Your data analytics needs become simple to manage too. Just ask about our Wi-Fi analytics, video analytics, and facial recognition services. Our mobility service, Mobile Roam, gives you the most cost-effective and best worldwide 4G LTE data, voice calling, and even VPN service. Here is how it works. NetPlus works with multiple network providers to provide you with a true diverse connectivity. You get dedicated account management, a single point of contact for all your IT infrastructure and communication needs. You get a 24-7 network operations center with proactive network monitoring, giving you total peace of mind. NetPlus is also a one-stop shop service for design, implementation, managing, monitoring and analysis of all subscribed IT resources. We guarantee up to 99.99% .99 uptime. Our pay-as-you-go plan helps you cut costs massively. Sounds interesting? Then contact us at www.netplus.asia to find out more. So you're an organization. So this brings me to the end of my sharing. I hope I was able to provide cybersecurity perspective from a business angle. And I've also included a complimentary vulnerability assessment scan in the event survey form. So just let us know if you need to have a scan. And if you and your, or your colleagues or your staff would like to know more about cybersecurity solution that I was sharing earlier, I have another webinar tomorrow at 3 p.m., which I'll be going more in-depth on the solution. So you're more than welcome to join me. Please scan the QR code or visit netplus.asia slash webinar to register. Otherwise, just reach out to me directly and I'll be more than happy to discuss your business needs. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Zaxon. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you very much for the uh, very insightful sharing on the data security and cybersecurity. So thank you so much. We'll see you later for uh, during the panel discussion. So now let's move on to our next speaker today, Kaleen from IMDA. Kaleen, the time is now yours. Thank you.
Hey, thank you, Jackson. We are, let me just pull up more. All right, so I hope everyone. Yes, it's all, it's all, it's all good. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Right, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Colleen from uh, Data Innovation and Protection Group of IMDA. And as the name actually implies, we promote both data protection and innovation among businesses. And this includes, of course, the educational and the publicity portion on the PDPA. So some of you may have heard, right, the PDP amendment bill was passed in Parliament last month, right, early November. And the enactment date is expected to be early 2021, right? So we don't know when yet. So it's likely to be the first quarter of next year. The um, gazetted bill, the hands up, is actually all over 100 pages. So the scope is really quite a fair bit under this amendment bill. Uh, we have also published our draft advisory guidelines on the amendments. That's about 50 over pages. So I will actually try my very best to give you an overview of all these amendments, as well as um, some details on each of all these uh, uh, proposed uh, amendments as well. Right, so that you can have a good sensing of all these. But after the session, please do spend some time to actually read through the amendment bill. Uh, otherwise, I will draft advisory guidelines that will actually help businesses as well. Right, so a very quick um, overview, uh, the background of PDPA before I dive into the amendments. Uh, PDPA was enacted in 2012, right? So as a baseline standard for personal data protection. All right, so it recognizes both uh, consumers' uh, need to protect their personal data as well as organizations' need to collect uh, personal data. So it has always been a balance of both of this. All right, so in recent years, in particularly the past 12 months, Singapore's digital landscape economy has evolved due to advances in uh, technology. There is also the call for stronger organizational accountability with the exponential growth of data. So regulations like the PDPA will need to keep pace as well, right? So we don't want to be that kind of regulations where um, organizations are seeing it as impeding their business operations, right? We want to ensure that uh, the, the, the regulations, the rules itself actually enables and uh, build, help support organizations in terms of using data, unlocking Right, the value of the data and not just on data protection, data protection, locking and you know protecting it, but you are then not really fully maximizing the value of data. Right, so writing on the same intent of the PDPA, amendments are also based uh, very uh, strongly and further advancing it, I would say, enabling organizations to harness the data confidently, right, to innovate and of course to enhance consumer protection as well. So moving into the details of the amendments, they can be grouped into four uh, categories of pillars, namely accountability, strengthening organization accountability. So that it actually helps organization to build consumer confidence and trust. And as they share more data with organizations, that's where organizations you can confidently use the data responsibly, but yet also innovating it to the best. Right? We are also supporting organizations' use of data for innovation with an enhanced framework for collection, use, and disclosure of personal data. Uh, there is also the third pillar providing the enhanced uh, consumer autonomy over personal data uh, with the new data, uh, port, uh, data portability obligation. And of course, harmonizing the um, unsolicited commercial communications as well. And the last pillar that we've got here is expanding our enforcement actions, primarily to recognize and incentivize accountable practices of organizations on one hand, and on the other hand, to deter irresponsible behavior. Okay, so I will move into the first pillar on accountability. Right, so with a growing digital economy, because like I've mentioned just now, um, Organizations who should not be viewing PDPA as just a checkbox compliance. It, it is not just um, a checklist for you to check off and that's it, check one side, right? Um, in order for you to actually grow your business, 
that's where you need to think beyond uh, PDPA as a compliance, right? So you need to demonstrate responsibility for the data that you have collected so that you can build the trust, okay, in order to actually thrive and grow in the evolving landscape. This is what we commonly term as the accountability approach towards data protection, right? So accountability involves a risk-based approach to identifying, monitoring, and responding, right, to uh, personal data risks. So it involves the translation of data protection principles into practices that are tailored for each organization. So of course, accountability, risk-based approach, this is not new globally as well. A lot of um, uh, the jurisdictions, a lot of countries are also shifting the um, data protection privacy laws towards this risk-based accountability approach, right? So over the past few years, PDPC has actually embarked on a journey to support organizations to pivot towards accountable DP practices. So in 2017, we started with all the accountability tools, all the guides to actually help organizations. 2019, we launched the Data Protection Trustmark Certification right, for organizations that demonstrate uh, accountability in meeting data protection standards. Uh, on this, I will actually leave my colleague Dominic to share with you guys uh, later on. Right, so currently, of course, there is also the um, PDP Amendment Act. So this is where we are actually mandating some of these accountable uh, practices, right, which mm -hmm. includes a requirement uh, to notify PDPC and affected individuals of a data breach, as well as a requirement to assess the likely adverse impact on individuals before organizations use personal data for certain new purposes, right? So on um, mandatory data breach notification, so with the increasing uh, data breaches that may have significant impact on individuals, hence our uh, amendment bill has actually introduced this new obligation to report data breaches to PDPC if um, all these breaches are likely to result in significant harm or impact to individuals or uh, of a significant, uh, significant skill. So organizations must also notify individuals when a data breach is likely to result in significant harm or impact to them, regardless of the scale of the breach. Right? So this obligation actually enables the affected individuals to be known, to be notified early and take measures to protect themselves, either changing the passwords, etc. Right, so uh, the next questions uh, that naturally that will come to your mind would be what's considered significant harm and impact before you know when to notify PDPC, when to notify uh, affected individuals. Right, so to provide uh, certainty on the breaches that are notifiable, PDPC will prescribe a white list of personal data that is considered to result in significant harm to individuals in the regulations when the amendment bill takes effect, right? So the full name, full name, uh, full NRIC, uh, specify uh, medical information, information leading to the identification of a vulnerable adult or child, etc. So um, all these actually we have kind of uh, list down and spelled out in the draft advisory guidelines as well. So if you are keen to find out what are some of all, all this white list of personal data, do visit um, the website, download a copy of the draft advisory guidelines, right? So you can read up into more. There are also exceptions on the need to notify affected individuals, right? So they are meant to incentivize organizations to put in place good data governance, all right? To mitigate the risk to the individuals. While this exception actually um, allows you um, the need to be exempted from notifying individuals, notification to PDPC, still remains unchanged, you will still need to notify PDPC if any of the criteria um, actually, um, you, you actually need it, like whether it's significant harm or significant skill, right? So more of the details, examples can be found in draft advisory guidelines, right? So in the guidelines itself, we have also made it clear in terms of the duties of the data controllers, the organization themselves, as well as the data intermediaries, right? The organizations that processes our personal data 
on behalf of the organizations. So the duty to actually make the assessment, whether it is notifiable breach and how to actually notify PDPC or affected individuals, that is the duty of the data controllers. Data intermediaries, right? You will need to notify any breaches to the data controllers without undue delay from the time if uh, you have actually credible grounds to believe that the data breach has occurred. Right, so um, under accountability as well, uh, new offenses will be introduced to hold individuals accountable in egregious, uh, egregious uh, cases on ill intention of mishandling personal data. Right, so uh, introduction of these offenses does not detract from our position to hold organizations uh, primarily accountable. Right, organizations remain liable for the actions of their employees in the course of the employment with the organizations. So this actually new offenses are really for the individuals that um, you know, knowingly with the ill intent to actually mishandle personal data, right? So it includes you know, unauthorized disclosure of personal data, unauthorized use of personal data to obtain a gain or to cause a harm or a loss to another person, or also a reckless unauthorized re-identification of anonymized data. So of course, um, we also provide for various defenses for individuals, all right? If it is, say, um, it is uh, found out, realized that there is really uh, a mishandling by an individual itself, possible defenses for these individuals, we have also spelled out some. So if let's say the information is publicly available or the individual is actually doing a testing of anonymization systems, right? So these are the possible defenses that individuals may actually take. So the second pillar that we have here is on innovation. This will be quite a big news to organizations, uh, I would say. So if you're familiar with the PDPA, there is a list of other exceptions, right? So that actually, if the exceptions apply, there is no need for you to actually obtain consent on the collection, use, and disclosure of personal data. So on this innovation pillar, that's where we see amendments, all right, uh, introducing new exceptions to recognize legit users of personal data, as well as expanding the scope of deemed consent, right? This will actually facilitate organizations processing of personal data to innovate and meet consumer needs. So long that you comply with relevant safeguards, for instance, our mandated risk assessment, depending on um, the exceptions that you rely on, right? So in GIST, personal data may be used within organization and between organizations of the same group of company to improve businesses. If it is for the enhancement of products and services, improving uh, operational uh, efficiencies or to offer personalized services. So we'll come to a bit of the examples later. Uh, there is also the importance of commercial research and development that is not directed at existing product or process. Okay, it's also recognized now, right? So for instance, research labs and market research consultants. Okay. So organizations may also disclose personal data for historical and statistical research under this uh, enhanced exception. So moving on to the third one, uh, legitimate interest. So personal data will also be uh, legitimately used in the interest of ensuring system safety and integrity, right? So for example, fault detection, etc. Okay, and last but not least, uh, recognizing the need of data sharing involving multiple layers of subcontracting within the delivery or the supply chain. Right? So examples in the next slide as well. So of course, we will be introducing a new option to obtain consent through notification after a reasonable opt-out period. So for existing customers and where the new use poses no risk of any adverse impact. So of course, if you see, if you notice, there are two asterisks here. So for legitimate interest, as well as um, deemed consent by notification, that's where PDPC has also published an assessment checklist to help organizations in terms of the mandated risk 
assessment checks, right? So moving on to the examples on business improvement, the use of personal data by wearables companies, right? So that they feed the data into training the machine, the machine learning model. Uh, so to actually personalize new product features, the other example will be used by the banks, right? So they actually capture all this personal data um, to actually create a credit risk model to help uh, in terms of the operational efficiencies. So on legitimate interest, right? Um, I think a very uh, simple illustration, which I pull out from the other is really aligns as well, is for instance, hotels coming together to compile and share a blacklist of hotel skippers, right? Hotel skippers are those who don't fulfill payment for the use of hotel services. Okay, so it is possible to actually do a, a, a risk assessment and then to actually rely on this exception to actually use the personal data without consent. All right, there is the last one here, a last example on contractual performance, right? So basically it is like, let's say online retailer can have many um, layers, multiple layers of uh, suppliers or down the supply chain. Because if you buy something online, right, from an e-commerce platform, okay, uh, it, is, it may be just a platform, but then that's where there is also the seller as well as the logistics company as well. Right, so this actually relying on this uh, exception uh, actually provides organizations to actually, um, there is no requirement to actually seek consent at every stage, every layer of the supply chain to disclose the consumer's personal data to fulfill the contractual agreement, right? So of course on uh, this enhanced framework for collection use and disclosure of personal data, we have also published uh, infographics or rather a guide to help our organizations to navigate, right? So there is like, um, are you using personal data for this purpose, this or this? If no, then what should you do, right? So you can actually look uh, more into all these uh, resources that we have actually pushed up to help organizations. So the third one that we have, consumer autonomy. Okay, so uh, this is through a new obligation, data portability obligation. So I'm not too sure whether organizations are familiar with this. So data portability, okay, uh, it actually enables uh, individuals to request for their personal data to be transmitted from let's say service provider A to service provider B. Okay, so if you want to change as a consumer, you want to change a service provider, from A to B, there's no need for you to actually provide all your personal data to B. You ask A to actually transmit to B. So that is like really uh, providing some seamless uh, process here for the consumers. Okay, so what's covered under data portability? So organizations, of course, if it is um, the data falls within the scope, there will be a need for you to comply with the obligation and transmit the data over to another service provider or another organization. So what's covered will be electronic data, not all also, so I'll come to it, and also transactional data generated. Okay, so not, not within scope, data derived using business rules, algorithms, um, further data analytics, etc. Right, all this organization, you do all this yourself, all the research algorithm using AI, trying to track uh, behavioral patterns, uh, etc. So all these data derive of the consumers, they are yours to keep, right? You are not uh, required to actually port or transmit these data. So in terms of the implementation of data portability obligation, right, um, it only applies to whitelisted data categories. And uh, of course the regulations is not out yet, uh, regulations will actually prescribe this whitelist as well as the technical requirements for porting, right? So this obligation will not come into effect when the enactment bill takes effect. It will only take effect when regulations are issued, right? So uh, next year, 
we are likely to have a pilot on this and we are doing a few rounds of consultations on data portability as well, right, before this actually comes into effect for organizations, right? The other part on uh, consumer autonomy, so PDPCs do not call provisions and the Spam Control Act okay, provisions actually both aim to address consumer annoyance and provide consumers greater control over unsolicited marketing messages. So during this review exercise, uh, we reviewed both pieces of legislation to rationalize the requirements across communication channels. Right? So when STA was up, when UNC was up, uh, there wasn't anything of instant messaging. Right? It wasn't in the market yet. So Telegram, WeChat, they are not. Right? So in terms of currently with this amendment, uh, we are actually including all the IM identifiers, instant messaging platforms under the SCA Spend Control Act regulatory requirements. Right? So uh, in the past, the sending of messages to emails generated using dictionary attacks and address harvesting software is prohibited under SCA, the Spam Control Act. So under the amendments, similar prohibition will be introduced under uh, do not call provisions. Okay, so we kind of um, harmonize it that way, so it's consistent. The other third one, uh, third, uh, uh, thing to note is that the breaches of do not call provisions are enforced as criminal offences today, but under the amendments, the do not call will be under the administrative regime, similar to how we enforce the data protection provisions. Right? This would be more to empower PPC to issue directions, financial penalties for any infringements, and enable PDPC to resolve uh, DNC complaints more efficiently. Okay, coming to the last um, pillar here on enforcement, as well, we are expanding our scope of enforcement actions. Okay, like I've mentioned, uh, what we are looking at this uh, uh, enforcement part is actually uh, two prong, encouraging accountable DP practices, as well as deterring irresponsible behavior on the other hand. Right, so there'll be more options for enforcement statutory undertakings in lieu of investigations, as well as the power for PDPC to direct complaints to resolve disputes through mediation, right? These options are actually to recognize and incentivize to encourage organizations to be responsible to take on the accountable, accountability approach towards uh, handling personal data, All right? So if let's say there's a data breach, if you already have uh, very good accountable DP practices, you have drawer plans, remediation plan, you can actually activate it. It's robust enough, you have tested. Uh, that's where you can actually write to PDPC to say, look, there's a data breach here, all right? I have a plan. I want to actually uh, kick off to actually initiate my plan, all right? And this is how it works and things like that. Okay, so if PDPC actually accepts the kind of undertaking that will be in view of investigations, there will be no investigations organization, you will have a time, a period of time, right, to actually execute your, um, to execute and complete that draw plans that you have, right, to actually resolve the data breach. Okay, so of course, on the other hand, to ensure effective deterrence, financial penalty cap will be increased. Uh, last time it was up to a million, now there is uh, another condition of um, 10,000 of annual gross turnover or up to 1 million, whichever is higher, right? So though this actually recognizes importance of personal data and align with other uh, legislations as well. Okay, so um, resources on the amendment bill for organizations, how do you find out more? If you want to know more in terms of, let's say the exceptions part, accountability part, etc look into our draft advisory guidelines, right? So there are a lot of examples there and it is uh, very easy to read, I would say, if you're familiar with PDPC's advisory guidelines. Okay, so um, 
there are scenarios, there are a lot of examples to actually interpret and relate to you how um, all the amendments actually work. So of course we have the guides and infographics as well. Okay, so um, with that, um, I'm happy to take questions at the end of uh, today's session. So I will pass the time now back to uh, Zaxon. Zaxon, thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you very much for the sharing just now. So now let's move on to our next speaker, Dominic from also from IMDA. Dominic, please. Hey, thanks, Saxon. Okay, let me share my slides. And I apologize first because it's thundering here. So you hear a lot of uh, thunder. Not from my sharing, but you just hear the thunder. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here yeah, for S Judge for CI. Uh, and uh, we have heard from the both esteemed speaker from Kendall as well as Colleen uh, on the importance of cybersecurity and data protection. Okay, so what I'm doing here is that I'm presenting to you uh, a tool that your organization could consider using okay, uh, to ensure that your organization has robust data protection standards. Uh, we, IMDA, we have, uh, we have uh, put in place three certifications that organizations can tap on. Okay? We generally call them the data protection certifications, uh, but today I will focus on the data protecting trust mark, which was launched in 2019. Okay, so First and foremost, why data protection certifications? Why, why did IMDA in the first place sat down and decided that, hey, this is something that's important and that is worth looking at? Uh, we believe that there are four data privacy trends. So first of all, okay, consumers increasingly demand for more privacy. Uh, gone are the days where you can use you know, your consumer's data as and uh, how you like to use it, you know, use it with impunity, uh, and nobody really Borders, or rather, nobody really catches or cares about it. Uh, but of course, with the re recent um, legislation updates, you know, in 2012, 2014, the PDPA, and then with the Act Amendment happening, uh, gone are those days. Okay, now there is a growing knowledge uh, in privacy matters. Okay, your consumers will become more conscious in how you manage personal data. Number two, digitalization leading to data overload. Uh, something that we don't really have to to uh, share too much. This is something that all of us are familiar, especially during these COVID times, okay? Uh, where companies, including yourselves, have experienced rapid digitalization and how you do things. Okay, so, so with this increasing, this acceleration of digitalization, okay, we're entering in this global digital economy uh, with research and collection and the use of personal data. And while we encourage companies to innovate with data, okay, it is something that you can use to your advantage, help your business to identify trends, uh, customer behaviors, for example. As we encourage companies to do that, at the same time, it is important to foster an environment of trust and confidence among your consumers and businesses. Number three, increasing number of data bridges. Okay, we are seeing an increase in the number of data breach. In fact, from 2018 to 2019, uh, the total number of organizations found to be in breach doubled. And there was almost a tenfold increase in the financial penalties between 2018 and 2019. So the issue here is not if, but when for many organizations. Okay, last but not least, we believe that uh, data protection could be used to your advantage. Okay, um, in 2020, which is this year, okay, so it's, it's fresh out of the oven, Cisco did uh, uh, what we call a data privacy benchmark uh, study, and they found that a vast majority 82% of organizations viewed privacy certification as a strong buying factor when selecting a product or vendor in their supply chain. Okay, so simply put in, companies that invest in data protection, they would build uh, greater consumer trust. You will stand up easier uh, from those competitors who do not. Okay, sorry for the thunder. How am so I mentioned earlier on, IMDA, we have a, a series of data protection certifications. In fact, we have three of them. So today I'm going to talk about Data Protection Trust Mark, which is a domestic certification okay, to help companies increase their business advantage and build trust with their clients and business partners. Uh, and it is based on the PDPA uh, and International Benchmarks and Best Practices. We have two other certifications, which if you're interested, you can take a look at our website. Uh, they are the APEC Cross-Border Privacy Rules, CBPR, as well as the privacy recognition for processes or PRP, okay, which are 
APEC certifications that IMDA is administering on behalf of the APEC. So do take a look if you're interested. Uh, but today, uh, what I will be talking about more is our data protection trust mark. Okay, this whole data protection trust mark is a certification. Okay, this is the number one thing I want to highlight. It is a certification. It is not uh, just a compliance tool. Uh, it allows you to stand up. It helps to establish and recognize that you have robust data governance standards to help you increase your competitive advantage and build trust with your clients in the global digital economy. So number one, strengthen compliance and encourage accountability. Uh, Colleen has mentioned earlier on that uh, accountability now is the buzzword. Um, especially with the Act Amendment is uh, codified, you know, it is uh, cast in stone. Yes, accountability is something that is very important for organizations. Okay, secondly, we want to have the objective of building, uh, providing competitive advantage for businesses, and thirdly, to boost consumer confidence in how you manage your personal data. And last but not least, we want to use the trust mark as a way to enhance and promote consistency in data protection standards, which means at the end of the day, uh, if I were to ask you a question, how do you know that you have good data protection standards in place? Okay, our aim is that your answer to be, oh, I am data protection trust mark certified. Simple as that. Okay, it is an enterprise-wide certification that is valid for three years, which looks at organization's data protection policies, your processes, and your practices. Okay. As of today, we have certified 38. Okay, the latest today is that we have certified uh, two more organizations. Okay, I believe the number is 40 now as of today. So fresh out of the oven, I didn't have time to change the slides because I just saw it uh, not too long ago. Uh, we can see the, the, the big names. We have the uh, SM, uh, you have the DDS and the, the AIGs, you know, you have the Crimson Launch, you have the big players, yes. But you also have the small SMEs as well. This is something I want to highlight. Uh, in fact, if you look at organizations like P2D, two-man team, rigid husband and wife team, this is something that is suitable regardless of the size. As long as you are a private company in Singapore, okay, as long as you're subjected to the PDPA, this is something definitely useful and beneficial for you as an organization. We developed the data protection, trust mark certification, based, of course, naturally on the data protection obligations, the nine of them. Uh, and we took it one step further. We incorporated international benchmarks and best practices, data protection laws from other countries like Australia, uh, Hong Kong, European Union's GDPR, and uh, international benchmarks like OECD guidelines, and of course, the APEC privacy framework, which is closer to home, to come up with four key principles of the Singapore's data protection trust mark certification. Okay, and they are number one, very briefly, number one, governance and transparency, whether you have the data protection policies and practices implemented, and whether they are communicated to your stakeholders. Number two, management of personal data, whether you obtain the appropriate consent to collect, use, and disclose personal data for the purposes that you notify to your individuals. Thirdly, now that you have collected the data, you have the appropriate consent, okay? We look at how you're gonna protect your data. So we look at whether the company has uh, in place appropriate information security policies, measures, practices, uh, whether there's a retention policy in place, an effective retention policy in place, whether you have a disposal policy, and whether you ensure accuracy and completeness of personal data. And the last but not least, the fourth principle, individual's rights, where we look at organizations, whether you provide for the withdrawal of consent, uh, access and correction by, uh, of the personal data by your individuals, by your customers. So these are the four key principles we look at. Now, after all this uh, talking about trust, uh, usually the next question is, uh, what is it in it for me as an organization? Okay? As an organization, what do I stand to gain if I go for the certification? Okay, so we believe that there are five uh, benefits and these five, ben uh, five benefits has been attested by our certified organizations as well. Number one, all of them agree that it provides the assurance to companies. Okay? It's a third party certification helps to provide that validation. It gives, uh, it provides an unbiased, neutral eyes look at your policies, your practices to ensure that they are okay. Okay, and going through this certification, it will help to increase your data governance uh, and uncover any gaps or any risks in your policies. 
Okay, so the beautiful thing about this is that uh, if you undergo the Trustmark certification assessment, okay, it is not an immediate failure. If there's something that's not right, it's spotted. What happens is that um, if the assessors come in, they take a look and they spot something that's not right, okay, that doesn't meet the requirements, they will share with the organization, they will highlight to you okay, any gaps, any areas for improvement, and they will allow you the chance to remediate. They will share with you some best practices in the industry. Okay, what other people are what other people are getting right and okay, what are doing right. They will share with you uh, so that you have the chance to put them in place to remediate and to close the gap. Okay, number two, we are looking at the benefit of raising business competitiveness. This is particularly for SMEs. Uh, we have one certified company, TRS Forensics. If you can see the logo right here, this uh, kind of cool logo here, TRS Forensics. They are a small SME in the data forensics industry sector. Uh, they were certified very early on, one of our pioneers, and they were invited to bid for a project uh, by a European MNC. Okay. They were the, they are SME, I remind you, SME Singapore firm invited by this MNC to bid for the project. Uh, and they won the contract. So they were very shocked. They were in a state of euphoria. Uh, and they went to ask this uh, MNC this question. Why us? Um, you know, we have so many competitors uh, who are so much better than us, but why us? Uh, they shared, the MNC, the legal counsel shared uh, that because the project involves sensitive data, they need somebody they can trust. Okay, and they noted that this TRS Forensics was certified with a Data Protection Trustmark certification. And while it is a domestic certification, okay, recognized in Singapore for now only, uh, to this MNC, they see it as something that is important, valuable, and would help uh, in this business, ensuring that uh, this, this uh, project is done in a trusted manner. Okay, so number three, it strengthens customers' trust, the benefit, the benefit. Uh, again, trust is something that takes a lot of effort many years to build up, but all it takes is one wrong thing to happen to bring it all down. One data breach uh, can cause damage, reputational loss, financial penalties, uh, like what Kenneth has mentioned, you know, there's a lot of costs uh, involved just to patch things up, to, to go back to business as usual. Okay, unfortunately, uh, after suffering a data breach, a lot of companies do not go back to business as usual. You can just go and read it up. A lot of companies, in fact, worldwide, once they suffer a data breach, that's it. You know, reputation loss, uh, their stocks plummet. Uh, customers say that, hey, you know, I don't really trust you. Uh, in fact, 70% of customers will usually leave uh, uh, the company, will, will usually leave a uh, uh, business after the business suffers a data breach. Okay. Fourthly, one of the key benefits also is that it allows you to demonstrate accountability to regulators. Okay, Colleen mentioned just now about uh, this uh, statutory undertaking. Uh, not just in Singapore, but globally, uh, certifications are a way for organizations to demonstrate accountability. So like what Colleen mentioned earlier on, um, the PDPC recognizes that if you are a company with good data protection policies, okay, okay, in the event of a data breach, if you are a company with a, a good data protection policies in place, for example, you are a data protection trust mark certified company, you may be granted the option of undertaking by the PDPC uh, in lieu of investigation. Okay. Uh, you can read it up. It's uh, out in the Guide to Active Enforcement uh, published by the PDPC where they mentioned trust my companies. Okay? You may be considered uh, for the statutory undertaking uh, option to help you put in place your remediation. And last but not least, the benefit increases overseas market access. Uh, again, another true story, one of our certified company, a uh, small player, uh, ventured overseas, uh, you know, getting a lot of positive queries okay? because they're trust certified. You know, when they talk to the regulators, the consumers, you know, there's a lot of positive vibes coming up from these conversations. And, uh, and this certified company mentioned that the Trustmark has helped them to cut down in terms of negotiation time uh, and help them to, 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 to get hold of uh, business contacts that would help them to open doors in those specific countries. Now, in 2020, there was a consumer industry survey conducted on the PDPA where for the consumers, they found that four in five consumers believe that companies that handle personal data should apply for the data protection trust mark. Okay, and three in four consumers prefer to purchase from and more willing to share personal data with data protection trust mark companies. This is a B2C perspective. From a B2B perspective for industry, seven in 10 companies prefer to do business with a data protection trust mark company for the very simple reason that 
if you are a vendor, you are uh, serving a client and you get into a data breach, okay, your client will be liable as well. Therefore, a lot of companies, they are mindful that when they engage vendors, they need somebody that they can trust okay, so that they won't get into trouble in case a vendor ends up messing things up. And two and three companies are keen to apply for the Data Protection Trust Fund as well. Highlighting the importance of the trust fund. Okay, very briefly, I will talk about all this in, in brief. Uh, you can find out more information on our website. So first and foremost, IMDA, we are the certification body for the trust fund. Okay, we have appointed a panel of assessment body, five of them right here. And uh, if you're interested to apply, you apply online and make payment. I'll talk about the cost later, don't worry. Um, next, what happens is that you will then move on to stage two, where you will need to select your assessment body. Okay. What will happen at this point is two things will happen. Number one, you will receive a self-assessment form. Uh, basically, it is your requirements that you need to meet. Okay. You need to demonstrate that you're meeting the requirements in order to fulfill uh, the trust my requirements. And once you have done this self-assessment form, once you have provided the evidences, you will engage an assessment body from the panel here uh, to conduct the assessment for your organization, which brings us to stage three. Stage three assessment, first and foremost, there's a documentation review where the assessors will look at your documents, your policies. So at this point, you cannot say that I have nothing in place. I have no policies. Everything is just in my head. Uh, I remember it. You know, I have a good memory and all that. Uh, however, it doesn't work. You need to have policies. Like any typical uh, audit or certification, you need to demonstrate in black and white you have all this in place. Number two, what happens is that after this is done, the assessor will come down on site take a look at your organization just to clarify certain policies, making sure that, you know, uh, things are, uh, making sure that, okay, uh, the policies are practiced on the ground, okay? And number three, this is what happens if there's any gaps identified. You will be allowed the chance to remediate, to improve yourself, uh, to meet the requirements. And once you have done so, okay, you complete the assessment and there will be an assessment report submitted to IMDA. And IMDA will assess whether, uh, whether we agree with the assessor's uh, recommendation to award or not to award the certification. And if, yes, we agree uh, that the organization has met the requirements, then the organization, your organization will be given the Data Protection Trust Fund certification. Okay. Now, talk about costs. There are two fees involved. The first one is an application fee of 535 dollars, okay, with GST payable to IMDA. Um, okay, good news is uh, it is way for SMEs. Uh, if you are SME applying it, we will waive it off. The bad news is the closing date is 31st December 2020, okay, because uh, we have this uh, fee waiver since the start of Trustmark, which is 2019, so it's been running for two years, okay. So if you are organization, you're SME, and you're keen to apply, you're keen to go for the Trustmark, okay, for example, maybe uh, next year you think that okay you have uh, some bandwidth to do this assessment uh, then i would strongly advise you to apply and state your intention that yes you are interested in the data protection trust mark before 31st december 2020. okay and of course uh, i mentioned that we have multiple certifications we have a sim single application fee uh, if you apply for multiple certification if they make sense to you there is a second cost assessment fee which is payable to the assessment body it depends on the size of your organization okay uh, for example, what is your annual annual, uh, annual turnover? Okay, uh, do you have multiple sites? Uh, what is the complexity? How complex is your organization's uh, business function? Do you collect a lot of personal data? Okay, so but I can give you a range. Uh, if you are SME, on average, it should not exceed five thousand dollars. Okay, if you are SME, it should not exceed five thousand. Okay. Uh, but of course, at the end of the day, if you really want to be very sure, uh, feel free to approach our assessment bodies just to get the quotation. No obligations anyway. And now, the next question after I talk about costs is any funding available? Yes. The good news is Enterprise Singapore is supporting the trust fund as well as our other certifications uh, using the Enterprise Development Grant. Okay, as long as you're eligible, which is here, I won't go through everything. Uh, you can apply for Enterprise Development Grant. And uh, what I understand is that uh, Enterprise Singapore has increased the support quantum for SMEs to 80% uh, until 30th September 2021. Okay, that's the latest news I've heard. Okay, so 
So don't worry. If you think that uh, you are keen, but financially you may not be that strong, uh, there is this grant available. Go for it. Apply for this grant. It is very helpful. Okay, up to 80% for SMEs. Okay, um, this is my last slide. Feel free to visit our website. Spend some time, take a look whether this makes sense for you as an organization. I can tell you that it will strongly benefit you as an organization. Uh, and also read about our success stories. Okay? We have published a series of uh, success stories for certified organizations. This is what we do if you're certified. If you're certified, we'll engage you for marketing purposes, uh, you know, outreach and all that. So this is something that you can consider. Uh, take a look, read about the stories. Find out what, are, what is the motivation behind these organizations going for the Trust Fund certification and how it has benefited um, them. Okay, you can read about the TRS forensic story here as well, how they won the contract. Okay, for any queries, feel free to drop us an email, um, give us a call, uh, and we have a QA and a after, this, um, after the presentation, so feel free to ask me any questions you have. If not, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dominic, for a very insightful sharing. So we'll see you later at the panel discussion uh, soon. So now let's move on to our last speaker, uh, Elsa from Chap Insurance. Elsa? My name is Elsa. So Chap has been the uh, writing cyber insurance for 20 years. And um, as one of the world's largest cyber insurer, we believe it is important to raise awareness of um, the issues that uh, business owners face in managing cyber risk. So, after having all the necessary system and network controls, adhering to all the PA, PDBA changes, so what is next? In my view, as business owner, it's important to protect your company's balance sheet by having insurance protection. So in the coming years, cyber risk is forecast to cost global businesses substantially in lost revenue. So as Singapore um, invests heavily in digitalization, company will need to be more prepared especially so that there are more changes in PDPA as announced by Parliament um, in November. So in fact, in the past months due to COVID-19, businesses went through massive digital transformation. And in my view, uh, it should not come as a surprise that cyber resilience will become a necessity. In fact, business owners will face uh, some harsh reality if they continue to harbor the misconception and ignorance about cyber in uh, incidents and the resulting cost of not having insurance protection. Right. So these are the um, common misconceptions according to our cyber survey conducted with uh, Singapore SMEs. So nearly two thirds of Singapore SMEs reported experiencing a cyber incident in the past 12 months. So I would like you to know that a serious cyber attack has the potential to do far more reputational and um, operational damage to a business than a tangible incident such as burglary or arson. So while more businesses are getting smarter about this, far too many businesses remain uninsured against cyber risk. And business owners, some of them might think that there's nothing that the hackers or the bad actors want but do you really know the cost of digital identity and what will be stolen in this cyber attacks? The Internet Securities um, Threat Report in 2019 said, highlighted the value of commodity price on the dark web. So you think about it. What are the values of the data that you hold? And according to our claim statistics, the average claim cost of first party expenses following a cyber event are substantial. So if I may relate uh, this to uh, car insurance for simple understanding, it, this would mean um, own damage expenses following an accident. So you know, own damage third party. So if you do not have a cyber insurance, your company balance sheet will suffer, looking at the cost that you need to pay in the, in the event of a cyber event. And these are the reported incidents by industry over the last decades. These are all chopped real-time um, information and data. And you will note the, um, the, the exposure statistic by trigger over the last um, decade. You know, you can see that a high percentage resulted from um, human errors, hacking, and privacy violation. 
Following, I will share a few some interesting claim studies and how CHAP Insurance Incident Response Platform speedily facilitate and assist our policy holder. Case study one is actually the cause of it is a ransomware attack. So what happened? Our policy holder is uh, actually in the in advertising industry. Their revenue size is about Singapore 30 million. And it happens, um, the incident happened during the weekend. So a malicious file was um, uh, actually infected the company server and all their files, their data, historic were all locked up and affected. The hackers was very savvy. They locked up each server with a separate password. They demanded Bitcoins for each server. And then, um, as you know, Bitcoins are usually the mode of payment. So it takes time to procure, it's hard to trace, and then the prices fluctuate, just like what Kenneth have mentioned, like today is worth 24,000. And just two years ago, sometimes it dropped to 5,000. So our policy holder couldn't continue with their business and um, they could not deliver their customer's order. And um, according to them, each day downtime, it cost them about $250,000. The hacker said, Demand will increase after two days if you don't make the payment now. Hence, time was the essence and ensured our policyholder had to act quickly. So what did they do? They contacted our hotline. Within the first hour, um, the incident response manager was in contact with our policyholder. And within two and a half hours, the IT forensic was on site. They worked with our policyholder to see if they can restore access um, without having to pay the Bitcoins. Public relations firm was put on standby and within 12 hours, the IT forensic was able to identify the ransomware and managed to manually clean to server and restore data. But then, you know, there are many, many servers. So the rest of the, the demand was not easy and the key to decrypt was required. So what's next? Um, the incident response team, CHAP incident response team managed, um, they begin identifying the key server which, which was needed to restore ASAP. And then they negotiated with the hacker to make payment in parts. So before they actually remit the payment, um, the incident response manager actually tested the decoder to make sure that it works. And then once it works, the payment was made and a key to the server was obtained in parts. And in between, because the Bitcoin's prices fluctuate, there were renegotiation of deals. So as, um, as the decryption was being obtained, you know, like each server was decrypted and clean. And um, our incident response manager and our policy holder, they worked carefully together not to give up, you know, which was the critical server. So they worked closely together in a negotiation with the hacker. The negotiation process was taking time. And in the meantime, you know, um, public relations specialist was asked to contact the customer, to ask to contact our policy holder customer to inform them of the delay in the delivery of their order. So for the remaining server, which was less critical, our policy holder decided not to pay ransom. So within a 10 days, um, business was fully restored, ransomware was removed, and there were recommendations by our incident response team um, to prevent recurring. So as you can see from these slides, um, this cyber incident was reported through our 27, um, uh, 27 hotline. And oh no, it was, it was through the cyber alert mobile application. And then the following stakeholders were um, activated to provide a holistic response to this incident. And for the claims study, which I've just mentioned, it cost us about $200,000. Imagine if you do not have this insurance in place, um, you would have to bear this $200,000. So initially, if we look back on this case study, which I just mentioned, um, initially it was just the incidents response and the cyber extortion um, section, which was uh, activated, which was triggered. However, 
you know, while going through the process, it realized that actually the incidence response process actually impacted several other um, insuring clause of the insurances. So the first part for us, the first part that is very important to you as the business owner and for us is to contain the incident. So um, our hotline is there to help and um, the, the others actually follows and can be pretty quite smooth. So alternatively, our insured can also choose to, in, to engage with us or even propose their own vendors. But in the case of, uh, in the case of this case study, time was the essence. So we would usually highly recommend our, our policy holder to go to our hotline, which is one stop, and they will have access to these um, services. Case study number two is a ransomware attack and it affected local drive. So this is a Singapore uh, study, it's actually our claims. So it's actually a construction company and they outsource their IT operations um, um, to another company. So they actually suffer, uh, they actually suffer a ransomware attack because their employees actually click a malicious email causing the companies, customers, and project data to be encrypted, which means to be locked up. So this whole incident actually trigger, uh, trigger ransomware, incident response expenses, data recovery, and also loss of business. And it cost them up to $500,000. And bear in mind, this, this company's revenue is only $5 million. So imagine, yeah, without the assistance, without the the necessary expertise, they would have incurred much more because, because actually they tried to, to negotiate themselves. They tried to negotiate with the extortionists and then uh, the attempt was failed and additional costs were incurred to reconstruct and then to re-enter customers' um, project records. So it, it kind of delayed the whole process, incurring more costs and then more downtime and more loss of profit. Case study number three. So this is an engineer um, energy firm. Revenue size is about 20 million. It's also in Singapore. There are about 100 employees. So what happened is that the company executive laptop was stolen from a corporate vehicle. It contained significant private customers and employee information. Although the file was encrypted, um, the overall protection of the laptop was quite weak. And then the pin was um, easily compromised. So likewise, they contacted our hotline. So after assessing the nature of the information of the laptop with a forensic expert, it cost them 50,000. And then um, the company decided that they wanted to voluntarily notify relevant customers and employees. Um, and they actually set up a call center to monitor and then to provide restoration service. And all these additional costs and um, um, this whole incident, including the additional costs and including the regulatory investigation, it actually cost the company 325,000. And this was paid, this was paid by our policy. So the last case study which I'm going to share is, um, is actually uh, unhappy employee. So this unhappy employee actually assess the human resource platform of a uh, professional service provider, which is our insured. So what happened, they acquired and then they sold the security information on the black market. And then um, luckily he was being caught. But then thereafter, there were several cases of identity theft against the, our policyholders' employee. And this cost them $75,000 just because of an unhappy employee. So, so from all these, you can see that cyber insurance is not just about covering hacking and viruses. It encompasses more than that. And from this claims example, you will note the importance of having a robust incident, incident response platform. And I'm happy and proud to share with you that actually there are three easy ways. Um, if you're a policyholder, there are three easy ways to notify a claim. 
Firstly, it's through a 24 hour seven hotline. Next is through our website. And then lastly, you can actually download a cyber alert app from uh, App Store or Google Play. So our incident response team will be able to coordinate and assist you through any cyber uh, attack or breaches. So with that, I conclude my presentation. I'll pass the time back to the host and the rest of the speaker. Do feel free to ask us any questions. Thank you, Elsa, for the very insightful sharing. So now let's invite all our speakers today, uh, Dominic, Colleen, and Kenneth, to on your mic and uh, video again to join us for the uh, panel discussion right now, a quick one, because actually we're supposed to end at 4.30, but because uh, very insightful and contentful of the sharing just now, uh, I think we uh, extend our a little bit, like, about half an hour for our our uh, question and answer now. Okay, can so uh, can I have the question on the screen? Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, okay, <clears throat> okay. So we move on to the question and answer. So actually, there's uh, quite a number of questions. We have about sixteen questions. Uh, we'll try to address as much as possible. So uh, okay. So I think we okay just now uh Elsa you mentioned about the uh, the after ransomware and the aftermath everything so I think quick a quick one because actually there's a attendees asked this question about the so called what is the prerequisite of using I mean to have to apply maybe for a cyber security because you know if you apply for personal sex, uh insurance right yes. or maybe maybe health insurance I need to go to a health checkout la everything but for for cyber insurance, is it any like prerequisite that SME and companies need to be aware of? Um, generally, there's no prerequisite, but then um, it will be good that actually they have the necessary protection. And then all we need to know is their revenue size, what they need to do, to fill out a simple questionnaire, send it back to us, and we can assess and let them have uh, uh, a quotation or, you know, we can have a discussion over the, the coverage that they want to have. Okay. And so, yeah. So also, also that uh, there's another attendees asked that whether, uh, uh, because you, know, you mentioned ransomware and yeah. there, there are cons, because I know for us, let's say I, I mean, touch I, I injured or I, I sick, I need to have some medical report la, to report for, the, to claim for my insurance. So for data breach or data or cyber, cyber attack, this right. kind of thing, what is the, I mean, uh, advice step for, for the companies to take in order to like make sure they are, they are fully protected and covered by all the things? I think, I think first and foremost, um, generally companies will have their own sets of um, protection from a start like system protection, a simple basic firewalls. So to trigger the policy, it really depends on um, what happened. It can be a, a hacker's attack. It can be just a malicious, malicious act of a third party. So, you know, usually it happens when you, the, the company will, will realize that, oh, how come, you know, the whole company cannot own the system? What happened? And they will realize that, oh, the system network has been compromised. And what they can do is quickly call our hotline and someone will be in touch to guide them through what is the next step. But um, for me personally, I would advise the business owner to have a list of um, people who to contact in the event of such breaches, printed out and put it at accessible area. Why? Because in the event of any cyber breaches, you network um, network breakdown. There's no way you can access to your laptop or to your emails to get all those contact. So, so I think this is one of the uh, one of the best practice that I will share. So, uh, okay, thank you, Elsa. Thank you so much. So, okay, uh, we'll move on quickly because we know that uh, directly we are extending the, the webinar. So, okay, for, for, because, okay, let me scroll through the question. Uh, give me a minute. Uh. Okay, so, uh, okay, this question is to Kenneth. Kenneth. Okay, so uh, yes. before Circuit Breaker, the ransomware is a very hot topic for, for, for the company to be aware of. Like because they know they need to pay bitcoins la, everything la, to the to the to the to the whoever asking for the money la. So, but is this ransomware still a very hot topic, or actually the antivirus, anti and all this? Because you are the data security expert, so we want to know that what is the current major threat for company facing besides those normal data breach, and is it the ransomware still valid or not? 
Well, first and foremost, I think uh, ransomware has never gone away. It has always been there. Um, last year, I think I report. Well, I mentioned in my in my stats that there was thirty five cases as of last year. That was with the report by uh, CSA. But uh, as actually in this year, from January to October, mm -hmm. there is actually a sixty one cases already. So it's actually increased. Wow. And there's something called ransomware as a service, phishing as a service. They go hand in hand. So when ransomware as a service is that the owner of the of the created this this tool, this ransomware tool, to be sold to anyone who wants to do ransomware. And then there's phishing as a service where they have platforms where they help you to sell, uh, help you to blast. So they take commission in the dark, on the dark web through these such um practices. So it's actually not Oh, it, it's still there. It's just how sophisticated. And if you just Google the news of the recent ransomware, there's actually quite a lot of cases still. Yeah. So don't don't take it as it's, it's gone away. It's like tech is never away. It's always there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ken. So how about, uh, because we also have participants been asking, right? The, uh, okay, I think let me scroll out a bit. Then I'll show you that I'll answer live the question to let everyone also see the question. Give me a minute. Huh? Okay, scroll up. Scroll up, scroll up, some more. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay. So, yeah. This uh, this about employee training because just now you mentioned about the employee is the highest risk, right? Uh, to yes. to have maybe you have a potential data breach. So this but it's not us. I agree that employee is the highest. How often do you think we need to give them the retraining to ensure the integrity of cybersecurity? So because we, we chamber here, we keep advising all those SME continue to train and make sure your employees up to have all the up to date knowledge and information and know what to do to prevent all these data breach la, data leak la, and cyber attack. So what is advice in terms of ensure that this weak link of employees being eliminated and how often is the training or how well or how do how should company conduct this kind of training? Okay, so in terms of uh, how often, how, how regular you should do it, I think there is no definite answer. The thing that companies need to consider is how much you value your data, number one. And then is your company, the, the employees of the company, are they, you know, what's the level of the cyber resilience? You know, is it, is it on a high or they are very, you know, uh, don't know anything, you know, sometimes they just, then haven't exposed to this risk before and have no idea. So you want to do more training and then probably segregate them uh, over the year and then scale down a little bit by bit. However, um, having phishing, phishing training for, for, for employees is important. You want to do it, I would suggest every quarterly, right? Personally, I would say every quarterly is a good because the first one, two months when they click on the emails or maybe the first time they click on the email, they are like, eh, got this thing. So it's a phishing simulation, right? And then they are like, ah, I'm going to go for detention class, go for training. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you go for online training. And there are platforms that we provide to provide the sort of simulation as well as e-learning so they understand. And then after that, there's reports. There's also uh, there's a, there's a re management report to see hey, which employee click, uh, who click, and then you, know, you want to monitor such because these are big risks, right? Then we move into the next quarter. They're like, I, don't know, I clicked once already, so better be on the ball now. So they have that mindset to be alert. So even internally at uh, my own company, we, we do provide um, phishing simulation. Like year end, there's a festive now. So there's a voucher card that uh, our partners have shared. Whoever clicked, I think good luck to you. You go for a detention class, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know. However, it keeps me on the toes for the next quarter. So if this person still click and then next quarter again still click, okay. Now, business need to, the business owners or need to think through, is this person able to handle data? Because this person who click and click and click will one day click on the wrong one. <laughs> All right? <laughs> okay. All right. So I think one of the things also need to be recognized, I think some advice to the company is that, uh, because you point out is a very good point is that employee is a big link, but a lot of companies actually do not recognize this. So yeah, I think Kenneth had already demonstrated and showed you that, telling you that, yes, human error is the error that uh, we need to be very focused. It's always a joke, like people asking why they cannot have a self-driving car because the AI computer need to drive is many. Those haywire people is human. Human is the one that's not very reliable compared to machine. So yeah, so all companies out there, we need to continue to train mm -hmm. our employees to, mention, to, to ensure that cyber security integrity is there.
Okay, so thank you, Kenneth, for the for answering that. So, uh, okay, next question will be to Colleen. So, very, very quick one. Uh, this participant asks, I really worry that my company is not complying with the latest BTBA <laughs> requirement. How? Yeah, because I, we do understand, because after the amendment uh, coming out, I mean, just now you shared a very uh, insightful and very uh, important message. But I, I mean, for, for us, the company, I would say that a lot of people still they are about queue. They still <laughs> catch no ball. La. So what is a, maybe a quick advice? Like maybe reach out to you guys or how? how, how I, should, I really very scared. I mean, let's say... Okay, I think the gist of the amendment itself really is focused on accountability. We want organizations to really build upon and to shift that kind of change that kind of mindset is that um, manage your data, you know, really based on, you know, put yourself as the consumers. Uh, uh, how are you going to manage? How, how do you expect um, organizations to manage your data, right? To ensure that, you know, it is properly safeguarded, etc. So the accountability, being responsible, that is uh, the mindset that we want um, organizations to undertake. So even if the amendments that are, you know, new rules, etc. Actually, a lot are focused on uh, strengthening that kind of accountability within organizations as well as to provide, you know, um, greater use for the data. So it is not all um, bad for the organizations, right? So we don't want organizations to think that, you know, PDPA is very difficult to comply. Now with the new enhanced um, PDPA with all the amendments, there are more things that they need to look out for, right? Um, basically, the, the financial penalty, yes, it is heavier, but then what we want to build upon is all the accountable DP practices that you have. Once you have that in place, actually, um, it is not like once you breach, that's where PDPC come in, we slap you with the 1 million or, you know, up to 10% of your, you know, annual uh, turnover, that kind of um, fee. La, all right. So we will actually look into the nature of the case. All right. What kind of steps have you actually done? Okay. To remediate, to mitigate any risk. Okay, are you prepared for it? So these are all the accountable DP practices that we want to um, see in organizations. So that's why we have also provided a lot of help and resources on our website. Unfortunately, today's session, I cannot, I, I don't have the time to actually share on um, what are the practices that they can put in place. So I only have the time to really focus on the amendment itself, right? So if um, you go to the PDPC website, we do have a lot of, you know, like um, you need to appoint a DPO. How do you actually build um, DPO competency, right? So there are all the skills and competencies trainings that you can actually send your DPO um, to. And then uh, we also have all the guides on uh, DPMP, how to put in the policy, how do you ensure the right people, and then the processes are in place. Right, so it's a step-by-step -step guide to bring you through how to work out your policy uh, in terms of notifying um, uh, your customers. We also have like, a notice generator to help you with a notice template. And that's your first start to actually uh, adapt the template and then you put it up. So, so there are all these tools and uh, resources in place to actually help organizations. Right, so of course, demonstrating accountability once you are over there already, how do you actually use it as a differentiating factor? That's where the trust mark will actually come in. Right, so um, I would say uh, we don't want to go to the extent that we, we, we instill that kind of fear in organizations. Okay, so um, it's really building uh, accountable DP practices, having in place the data breach management plan ensure that um, you have a uh, close monitoring uh, mechanism and then you know what to do in cases of incidents, how do you actually uh, react to it, our guide to managing data breaches, we also have that kind of uh, framework to help you formulate uh, the, the data breach management plan. Yeah. Okay, Ken, so I think it's always when it comes to law, legal, regulations, it's very important that if you hear from the law, it's always go to go back to the spirit of the regulation and law. So I like what Colleen just mentioned, just now, we are not. I mean, I believe we are not. The the laws, and, the rules and regulation is not to smack you with the heavy fine, but to also help each other. No matter it's your business or your customer or your future growth. So we understand that. I mean, for us when we go to the amendments bill, it's really feel like an uncharted land. 
but I believe on at PDBC website and all the IBM website, you have a guide and a map for you to really chart it out. Okay, so thank you, Kelly, for that question. Okay, so follow up on this. So actually, there's Balisa also asks, how about data and information flow between business? Because you're often saying that the data breach, right, Kelly? The PDPA is the thing is like the consumer like the do not call every something like that, and also maybe the the data leak that they do need to prevent your the data officer. So, but because business and business transaction, we always face this question from the business committee. Hey, I I know I need to be complying with all this, but I send a lot of data across. Like I although I got all the consent, but when I send ah, I really scared that I got something breached. So how what is your advice? I mean, or what should be business should take note when they are exchanging this kind of like. Uh, data information between different businesses. Okay, under our transfer um, obligation of PDPA, we have actually mentioned that you know when you are transferring data to organizations or sharing data between organizations, you need to ensure you really um, the purpose is there, and then is there any agreement set out the agreement a contractual agreement. Or um, if let's say overseas organization, do you actually have the kind of binding corporate rules? you put in place all these processes, ensure that the organization also, the receiving organization, also has in place certain processes and SOPs in terms of uh, safeguarding using that kind of data that you are going to transmit over. Okay, Ken, thank you, Kalin. So uh, the guide is there, so just follow the guide and if you're not sure how to do, I believe you can always reach out to MBA and PDPC. Okay, so let's move on to our next question. These questions, I say these are, uh, T H E S E is to Dominic. So, uh, quite a few participants ask. Is the first one is asking is DPT, DPTM recognized overseas? How does it help if I advancing to overseas market? Then the next one is asking is the DPTM recognized in Euro or Canada where countries have higher data protection requirement? And another one also asks is DP, DPTM Singapore's only the standard certification equivalent for to GDPR? Can uh, uh, body ask overseas customer to partner or to check with IMD PDPC for clarification? I think the main thing here is to ask how does DPTM help your companies when they are dealing with overseas market and how does it help because we know that Euro, America or Canada they have stricter, tighter so how does it compare and what, what if the company need to deal with it overseas does it help or what, what is your, what is your uh, suggest and comment on that Ken, I will very briefly share I think first of all I set the context right that the trust mark is a certification GDPR is the law Okay, so GDPR equals to PDPA, for example, in Singapore. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, and um, the Trustmark certification, it is a domestic certification, meaning that it is only currently recognized in Singapore. Okay, for now. Okay, I say this for now. Okay, I mean, there are efforts that, of course, we hope that it will go overseas, recognized by overseas countries. But for now, it is only recognized in Singapore. Uh, however, having said that, Okay, in around the world, there are actually very little um, data protection certification, very few of them. Okay, we have one in Japan. Japan is, I think, the only uh, one of the countries I can think of that has a very uh, significant number of uh, certified companies under their own version of the Trustmark. Okay, Korea has one as well. Okay, uh, but what makes it stand out is that because the Trustmark, the data protection Trustmark is administered by MDA, uh, we, I, I believe we are the only government uh, sorry, this trust mark is the only trust mark in the world that is administered by the government. Okay, so when you think of Singapore government, what do you think of? You think of what quality control, you think, hey, good reputation, uh, this uh, government won't, won't uh, play punk, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and it brings along that reputation. So when, when countries are overseas, if you are venturing overseas and you are trust mark certified, um, this is again anecdotal uh, feedback I get from my certified companies is that, hey, you know, uh, people sit up and pay attention to these certified organizations. Because again, number one, uh, very few uh, certifications around the world for, uh, for uh, data protection, on data protection. And number two, because I administer my Singapore, it brings along the reputation. So while it is not recognized overseas, it helps to open doors, it helps to start conversations. Um, and if you have, if you're a vendor, for example, bidding for a project overseas versus other competitors who do not have some kind of, who do not have certifications on data protection, okay, you will definitely stand out. Okay, and this is again from our certified organizations' uh, stories. Uh. Um, yeah, I think I, I answered that question. Whether it, is it recognized in Europe, Canada? Yeah, so it, it's not uh, it, because again, it's in Singapore, domestic mark. Um, and um, yeah, I think that was a part of the question that asked about awardee, Canada awardee. That means a certified company asks overseas customers and partners to check 
with IMDA for clarification. Okay, um, I would I would think this question is asking about whether is organization certified. Like, how do you demonstrate that you are certified? Um, of course, there's a certification. You'll be given a certification, number one. You can put the logo on your websites or your publicity material, number two. Number three, we actually publish on IMDA a list of certified companies. So if, to, if I believe today or tomorrow, if you were to go to our website, you should see 40 uh, certified companies. Okay, so just use that link. So I, I think I answered that question. I yep. understand. So, so it's something like... Uh... Uh, although it's just locally recognized, but it's some it's a good things to have. Like some company you go and go go to get the ISO certificate, something exactly. like that. So and also it's a government back. I think it's very promising because yes. yeah, then people can check online. So I think it's a it's a good things for company to have uh. Okay, exactly. so I think because time constraint, I already expand about half an hour. So I don't uh maybe you try to wrap up with the last question for everyone of you. Uh, because today our attendees actually most of them are SMEs and company, yeah. and each of you guys today, right, actually share from very different perspective. Like the kind of can you share about the from the perspective of cyber security expert, then Colleen on the PDBA, and then Dom, uh, Dominic on the on the trademarks and the, the data protection, and also uh, Elsa, you're from the, the cyber insurance perspective and the aftermath and how to recover everything. So maybe a quick one from Kenneth. Okay, Let's start from Kenneth. A quick one based on your expertise and maybe a last final uh, short advice for the SME out there. How can they deal with the current climate in this era? What is your advice for the SMEs and companies out there to maybe to better deal with this kind of cybersecurity and data security in this digital age? Okay, yes, starting Kenneth. Maybe you first. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. In this, I think first of all, organizations, uh, companies, we need to have a zero trust policy, all right? Uh, we cannot be taking things for granted and assuming that it's okay, and then we click on links. Education is important, as I shared earlier, as well as and then you have a zero trust policy. There are various angles to protect your 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 company, and. Cyber attack has very attack comes in various forms, as I shared earlier. So, so what is valuable? You want to, of course, focus more on those, but don't neglect the other areas as well. It has to be holistic. So, the more as as the saying goes, the more you protect, the more secure you are, the safer you will be. So, if and I also understand that companies have a lot of challenges in implementing everything because it is almost impossible sometimes, right? Especially when the heavy investments. So. But don't, don't shy away from understanding it first. So it may not be as expensive as what you think. Right? So don't let cost be the factor first. Get the, the ideal solution, then scale down or scale up depending on what you require. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Kenneth. So thank move you. on, Colleen. Based on your expertise or maybe personal data protection or this, what is your maybe a short advice to, to the SME and companies out there I mean, what is the spirit or what is the very crucial thing for them to continue to survive or don't be smacked by the, <laughs> the fine everything for the companies out there to have, uh, I mean, the final advice for them uh, to, to, to continue their advancement in the business world. Okay, I think the key takeaway, because I'm coming from the PDP angle as well, I don't want organizations to always have the kind of mindset that um, PDP is there to actually impede businesses and restrict um, all the operations that they have. Yeah, so um, if you look at it differently, that's where we have all the different um, uh, uh, rules there to actually help you to actually put in place a good foundation for you to actually move on uh, to actually grow in the digital economy. Yeah. Okay, Ken, thank you, Kaleen. So Dominic, yeah, you are the expert of the, the data protection, the trademark and everything. So what is your final advice and a very important suggestion and comment to the companies out there? Besides, okay, the get, getting the trademark is the thing that you, we all know that is very important and pushing, but what is the, uh, because what is your advice to those companies if they have a bit hesitation to go through all the process? Yes, what is your advice for them? Okay, final uh, advice? simply put it, this is definitely something useful for you as an organization. Uh, a very easy way to demonstrate to everyone, regulators, your customers, uh, your business partners that you can be trusted. And this, is, I think, is something that is priceless. It's worth the ROI in terms of the cost and effort. Uh, and of course, uh, to help organizations, SMEs especially, uh, to make it easier for you, there is actually grant available. And we have, of course, we have off the application. Unfortunately, it's until the end of this year, we, we, we acknowledge that. Uh, but it's been going on for two years, so, so very hard to push for it again. Uh, but the resources are there to help. 
Okay. So if you feel that this is something that you want to do, you want to devote part of your resources and, and uh, um, effort in this, let's say in 2021, then I would say apply now, go for the grant. Okay. Because part of the grant supports not only the assessment, it also assorts, uh, uh, supports third-party consultancy, which means that you're not so confident, okay, get in somebody to help you. Um, the enterprise development grants can cover that as well. Yep. So that's, that's, that's what I'll say. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dominic. So, okay, last but not least, Elsa. So you are the cyber, cyber insurance expert. So we always know that for insurance, we always pray we never need it. <laughs> or I, have not, I never use it, but I need it, but I've never used it, finger crossed, for any insurance. But based on expertise, what is the advice for the company out there if they huh, is it really need about cyber security insurance? Like, I don't even have insurance for my, my car or my, 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 my house. I only just a basement. Is it necessary or what is the advice for them? Because it's, all, it's part of the aftermath. So what is the advice for company if, if they really, uh, is it really needed or what? What is your comment? Sure. I think all the business owners here, they have um, different, different ways of running the business. They will have their business plans, you know, what's my growth target for next year, what I want to achieve next year, how to expand my business. All these are very important. But I hope that you remain open-minded. You must always cover your base. You must always leave the um, unnecessary or troublesome or hassle, hassle part of the business to the expertise. And with just a very small cost, your business will be protected. Your balance sheet will be protected. And then you have a group of expertise that actually help you to run along in such catastrophic event. That is the most important. You know, it's really low cost and um, broad coverage. And then CHUP Insurance, we always um, upgrade our wordings to be the market leading wordings and to be aligned with the market sentiment along with PDPA, along with what the parliament will, will pass. So bear in mind, keep us in mind, not just us, have a, have a broad, have a broad um, mind, be open, think about cyber insurance. That's why I would like to thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I just want to add on our, uh, sorry? I, I just want to add on one point, mm, actually. Mm. Please, um, please. It's because in one, one of the questions I saw in the list, uh, uh, someone was asking, is there 100% right, protection? Uh, and I'll have to say this, you need to first protect what you can protect, all right, from, from all various angles that you can protect. And of course, there's no 100% foolproof. Every, every solution out there in the market can never claim to be 100%. But what can be protected as the closing loop for the final 1-2% is using cyber insurance as a whole. So it forms a whole suite. Okay. Thank you, Kenneth. So I think that's wrap up for our session today. Once again, thank you. Kenneth, Kaleen, Dominic, and Elsa for sharing with us and answering all the questions just now. I do need to apologize because just now I was using my phone to try to uh, answer, I mean, to browse through the question, but I was unable to do so. So, so I need to like stare at the big screen. So I hope you guys can bear with us and forgive us because technical things do happen. So for today, actually, we have a very wholesome uh, session for you and, and contact for you. So from Kenneth, the cybersecurity expert to teach you, to, I mean, to let you know how to prevent all this happening. And also we have two, uh, can, uh, sorry, Colleen and Dominic from IMDA and PDPC to tell the laws and regulation. And Elsa from Chime Insurance, if really things happen, how to save your, or to cover your, your, your all, all this damage and everything. So it's a very wholesome. So do make sure that you fill out the feedback survey and you will continue the discussion with them because it's today, I believe all things regarding data security, all your information, all your contact is here. Okay, so once again, thank you for all the attendees today. Regardless, you are in front of your laptop or your handphone. We hope that you have learned very meaningful things today. And hopefully, you, with this information, you will continue to bring your business to a higher level and continue to advance your new normal. So before I end this session, let me quickly share with you guys some useful information. So one, uh, once again, please continue to support our future events. You may scan the QR code on the screen or simply follow us at our Facebook page, SME ICC, or log on to sgsci.org.sg for more info of our upcoming events like this, okay? So last but not least, please do not forget to fill in the feedback survey like I said just now. Once you fill out the, fill out the feedback survey, we'll be able to send you all the very wholesome information and contact for you to safeguard your interest in data security, okay? So once again, thank you to all the speakers today and all the participants. As usual, let's all stay healthy, keep fighting, and we'll see you guys soon in our next events. Goodbye! Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.